May 19th, 2013. On the last day of Sunday School in 2013, we celebrate the completion of our 101st year of Sunday School. Amidst the celebration, we pulled aside some of our congregation's oldest and newest members to have them share the story of what brought them to First Lutheran Church. My first memories of First Lutheran were when my parents brought me here when I was four or five and I had to go to Sunday school but I didn't want to and I was kicking and screaming and crying. And then one of my best friends today, Allison, she's like, just come in, it'll be fun and then it was all okay. And then we've been coming back ever since. Well, it goes back to the 20s. <coughs> and I um, started Sunday school. And um, I uh, decided I didn't want to come. But uh, my parents said, you're going. And um, I had um, very good teachers. I can't. I had wonderful teachers. When I got here, I was in uh, probably second grade. And I don't remember much about second grade anymore. But I went through second grade all the way up through the through every grade, grade there was. I was confirmed here. Um, I remember when I was in Sunday school, and it was really fun meeting new kids my age. Okay. Oh, I guess my first memories when I first joined, uh, I was five or six years old, and uh, uh, I joined the Sunday school and. Uh, met other young people and uh, uh, enjoyed getting to know other kids in the community away from the uh, uh, grade school that I attended. It is fitting for so many of our members, present and past, to have begun their time at First Lutheran as youth in the Sunday School class. First Lutheran has deep roots in Sunday School children's ministry, going back to the very beginning. First Lutheran began with three sisters, Marin, Anna, and Emily Jerbach. As students at Augsburg College, the sisters followed their calling and began holding Sunday school classes in an old fire barn in a rural area just north of the bustling mills of Minneapolis. While Minneapolis was rising to become the number one milling city in the United States, with a rising population of over 300,000, the town of Columbia Heights, which surrounded the sisters' makeshift schoolhouse, was a land of farms and prairie grasses with a population of under 600. Owing to growing attendance in district school, it became necessary to look for another place to hold our Sunday school. Through kindness of the Mrs. Jerbock, we accepted invitation to have Sunday school in their house until something definite could be done. A.W. Stowell, Secretary, September 18, 1910. Ladies Aid was formed by six women in 1910, and they were able to purchase a one-room building that allowed the Sunday school classes to grow. Worship services began that same year, and in 1912, it became the home for a congregation formed by seminary student P. A. Strawman. The seeds of First Lutheran Church had been planted in the then-named Zoar Norwegian Lutheran Free Church, and that seed began to grow. With the need for more space, Zoar Norwegian Lutheran Free Church sold the one-room building in 1915 and constructed ground-level walk-in at 40th and Quincy in the middle of Columbia Heights, and a sanctuary was constructed above in 1926. First Lutheran found its current namesake, and the growth was beginning as the rural town around it grew into its own. It has grown considerably. From 1925 um, until now, it's changed a lot. It has certainly changed a lot. You'd go out to 45th and Central and you're way out in the country already. There are cornfields out there, farms. It was quiet. It was um, um, run with streetcars. There was a trolley going up Reservoir Boulevard. 
um, where my brother and I would run to catch the trolley to get right here to Silver Lake School, where we went to school. Um, my, my grandfather and grandmother living in the Heights had an outhouse, so we had to run to the outhouse. And many of the families had the old ice box with the chunk of ice where the ice man would deliver the chunk of ice. And, and um, my grandma would cool the house by putting a chunk of ice on the floor and running a fan on it. And that was our air conditioning. The church was given many opportunities and faced many challenges as the farms and prairie grasses gave way to the modern world of streetcars, trolleys, storefronts, and pool halls. Well, the pool hall was a place where uh, uh, kind of the outlaws of the community are, uh, would go and uh, it wasn't a place that uh, uh, he recommended anyone should go there. A lot of the kids that went there were getting in trouble in school and so forth and uh, so he recommended that some place should not be frequented. I would guess that he thought it was sinful to go into a place like that. Probably would have been a place that they'd say, well, if you must be going out, don't be going to that pool Don't hall. be going to the pool. <laughs> Avoid that, yeah. It's just like, through the years, one of the pastors said, don't go roller skating. Do you remember that? All these bad things were, were played have cards, yes. have cards in the house. Yeah. Right. With the new sanctuary being only four years old, the Great Depression began to take its toll on the entire country. Things would seem to just get worse from there. Hostilities exist. There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. And in 1941, the Second World War caught up to the United States, and the country was shaken. The members of First Lutheran Church found strength in their faith and the community of Columbia Heights. Well, I remember my father coming up to this school with his ration coupons and picking up butter and sugar and different things like that, and he was a block captain. So he, when they had the, the lights out, he had to go around the neighborhood and make sure that everybody's windows were covered so that there wasn't any light coming out of the houses. And that was scary to me as a little kid. I remember um, what I've been told. My grandmother, Jenny Osmo, um, went around to all of the um, parents who had boys in the service from First Lutheran. Mm -hmm. And it was her idea to make the Good Shepherd window in honor of those boys. And my Uncle Ted was the middle child of her five children and he was in the Navy. And so Grandma dedicated the, the window, had it, collected the money and had it dedicated to the boys that were in the service. And then later, she had it put in the choir loft down at the old church. So as you came down 40th Hill, you saw the stained glass window of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, in the window. It was very cool. After the war, there was much work to be done in cleaning up the city. With soldiers returning home, and thanks to the introduction of the GI Bill, Columbia Heights saw more growth than ever before. When I came out of the service, I came down to the university, passed the entrance exams, and uh, I became a civil engineer. And that was because of the GI Bill. I figured out in later years that the government invested approximately $850 a year to turn this farm boy into a civil engineer. And the equipment that we had in our city at that time were in need of constant repairs but we were trying to build our streets, which were muddy and messy, and that was the main thing. I worked as the engineer, laying out the streets and utilities and uh, trying to get the streets passable. That was the big thing in the early days. And we had about 8,000 population, and I uh, worked for Columbia Heights until we had 24,000 population, so it was years of great growth and uh, we had to build 
uh, up from what was left over in World War II. The decades after the war were a time of building up Columbia Heights, and the church was building things of its own. The ever-present Ladies' Aid continued to support the community, their fellow church members, and each other. The first time I went to the Ladies' Aid, all I could, can remember is that I was so impressed there was always such good food. And um, the ladies of the church would meet once a month, and, many, and always there was food. And there were several circles at that time, but all the circles got together once a month. And they would do things like finding clothing for the, for the, poor. For the poor. I remember mom collecting library books for the library. Other groups began to build up at the church, including a supportive social group found in the Mr. and Mrs. Club. Well, back in those days, particularly in the 1960s, we were all in the same general situation. We didn't have much money, and for entertainment, this was a great outlet. We had our little children that we were all raising, and so we would get together at church, and this was uh, a big thing in our lives because this was our entertainment. and. Um, we had good meetings and built up friendships and uh, had so much in common that it was uh, a, a really good time and the meetings were well attended. We had a lot of members. The Mr. and Mrs. Club was a, a group that we had in our church and I didn't belong to it, but my, my wife said, why don't we join it? Because she wanted to get together with all the, the girls and boys and you know. And they were a married couple anyway, so we were married. So she wanted to join, and I gave in to her, and I, we joined it. And what we did there, we did the normal things that they did. Uh, we, we had lunches, and we, we met, and we talked to each other, and we went out and did certain things that we ch chose to do, and uh, we had a good Well, it was a club for, for young marriage, and uh, I think, as I remember, they, uh, we met monthly. Uh, frequently we had uh, various speakers would come in and talk to us. It was primarily a social club. Uh, we would have parties for their uh, uh, various holidays and so forth, a uh, Christmas party and this type of thing. We'd celebrate birthdays and uh, so forth. And it was just a, a way of uh, young marriage to get together and uh, uh, enjoy their Christian life. These years proved to be a time of ushering in the new. One of those additions was our very own Paul Christensen the first minister of music in the church's history. Paul began his ministry at First Lutheran by inviting the community to join the church choir. He served as an organist, and in keeping with the long history of serving the youth of the community, Paul conducted a choir school for children on Saturday mornings. I came to First Lutheran in 1958. I was a student at Augsburg College, and I was hired as a senior choir director. And having grown up on a farm in a small town, I was just overwhelmed at all the people that this big church had and I was excited to have a good choir and meet so many wonderful people. I've been in the choir since 1953 and that's always been an uplifting thing for me uh, spiritually. And It was important for the youth to have somewhere to belong. While the subculture of rock and roll began on the radio and television, the youth of America turned to the music of Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, and other rock and roll legends. The church, however, was leery of this new music. Well, the church in general was a little hesitant in accepting that kind of music. They thought it was pretty worldly. If you remember, Elvis Presley did a lot of shaking of his hips, and uh, people thought he was a little too secular for their young people to be watching. His gyrations were uh, criticized by adults. So it was uh, slow, we were slow to accept such kind of music and TV. Paul saw the changes happening in the world around him, and instead of shying away from the changing landscape, he helped the church to meet the youth of the community where they were at. Paul introduced contemporary worship to First Lutheran Church. Oh, the congregation was a little hesitant, but the younger people, of course, liked it. That's the music they were hearing on the radio. So uh, they were happy that uh, the music of the church had a little more contemporary life to it. 
And so, mixed reaction. Older people were hesitant, they were tradition bound, and young people were excited that this kind of music might be heard in their church and their worship experience. Over the many years to come, Paul would find new ways to meet the youth of the community where they were at, to give them somewhere to belong. If I were to tell you what someone told me It was called Tell It Like It Is by a man named uh, Ralph Carmichael. And our high school kids performed that in 1971. And that was a major breakthrough because there was a little bit of choreography with it, some hand clapping, and the story was youthful in spirit. So they were um, telling about and singing about things from their everyday life. And that became a big deal for the youth at First Lutheran. And it stuck ever since. We've been doing youth musicals all these years. From eight students and three sisters, to 2,100 members, three services, and a record attendance in Sunday school classes, the church had become firmly rooted in 4th and Quincy. The church knew, however, that a house does not make a home, and a building does not make a church. A church is its people, and the church felt it could not meet all of its family's needs. Because the old church had these long steps up into the sanctuary, and handicapped people uh, had a great deal of difficulty and just didn't attend church if they didn't have to because it was hard for them to get in. People had to help them up with their wheelchairs or walkers. This church building was built in the 20s for a smaller number of people and we were just overwhelmed with numbers of people. So there were three services and they were always full and the Sunday school was overflowing with Kids. There were a thousand kids in Sunday school at one time in the 60s and 70s. In 1982, they purchased the old Silver Lake Elementary School, and in 1986, they made the move. In the Love and Country this Sunday, a church on the move. In Columbia Heights, members of the First Lutheran Church trekked for about a mile in the rain today from their old church to a new one. After some 70 years, the congregation at the First Lutheran Church of Columbia Heights has a new home, and today they walk to it. The congregation is taking up residence at the former Silver Lake School because it has more space. Worship services will be held in the former school cafeteria until a new sanctuary can be built. It was both joyous and sad because... Uh, we were leaving the old church, which was so familiar, and coming up to something that we, you know, didn't know quite what, how it was going to work out. But it was a wonderful move. We made the right move, and it was difficult, but joyous, too. Oh, it was wonderful. There was such a big group. We really enjoyed climbing up 40th Hill, which is quite a steep hill, but it, uh, it was just... Just glorious, it was just wonderful. I felt so good. Oh, that was an emotional experience. People whose roots were in the old building, uh, they found it hard to leave that building. They had so many memories, they'd been baptized there, confirmed there, married there. And parents had been buried from there, so they had many memories tied into that building. And for them it was hard, but uh, it was an old, building that had seen its better day and the young people were optimistic that this move was a part of a bright future for First Lutheran Church. So It was kind of a sad day. It was a, a very gloomy, overcast day, a lot like it is uh, even today. And uh, that's the only church I had ever known. And uh, to leave that church and go to another one was uh, just kind of a sad occasion. Uh, the new church here turned out very, very well, but uh, the idea of totally leaving the church was uh, uh, kind of like losing a friend. The former elementary school was not without its drawbacks. Decisions had to be made about how to remodel the church, but the church made do. We had acquired this school building, and we were going to hold our um, church services in what is now Martin Luther Hall, but that was the big dining room of the school building, and that's where we held our services. And this was a good move because we could design our new building with a 
proper uh, access to get from one area to another with wheelchairs or walkers. And that was the important thing in my way of viewing it. And besides, we got a nice big sanctuary out of it, the new building. The rest of it is all usable, though. We're using all the rest of the school building. As any family would, the members of the church came together and volunteered over 2,100 hours of labor in remodeling the building, saving the church over $40,000. One year after that rainy day, the groundbreaking for the new sanctuary began. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have come together to seek God's blessing as we set apart this ground for the building of a church. So at this time, then, this ground is broken in the name of the Father, First Lutheran was making a home for current and future generations. With the completion of the sanctuary, First Lutheran Church had its roots once again planted in solid ground. Through the 1990s, the festivities continued, many sermons were preached, and the choirs sang on. In 2004, they financially secured their new home and looked ahead to what this meant for generations to come. The youth are, and were, some of First Lutheran's greatest resources, and the church wanted to be a resource for them. As it was in the beginning, First Lutheran has worked to remain a place for the youth of the surrounding city to call home, a place for them to belong. What are your first memories from First Lutheran Church when you first came here? Um, I started off by going to uh, after school because my friend Reality, she said that it would be good for me and um, we could be going to church together and I love hanging out with my friends. My first memories are when I came here and I met Nathan and some of the new people that came to my school that I really didn't know, but they were in the same grade as me. I didn't quite know them, and then I started being their friends. My first memories is when I came here for an open gym program with Nathan, and it was fun. What are your best memories about First Luther? Uh, making new friends. It was fun making new friends and uh, seeing um, how the pastors and the um, leaders made like welcomed me to their like family church friends. And what are your best memories of this church? Um, confirmation and all the youth events for sure were my best memories. I loved going up north and staying at camps and doing the 30 hour famine and all the lock-ins were a lot of fun. Probably the confirmation, the Sunday school. Oh, the food. That's good. <laughs> Uh, what members, both volunteer and staff, have had a, a positive influence on your life? Um, definitely uh, Jesse and Nathan and some, uh, like when Alicia was here, she made a big difference. Pat, Nathan, and Ms. Jesse, because Pat helps you with your homework if you're stuck on it, and Nathan is just fun to talk to sometimes, and Ms. Jesse is fun to play games with. They help me, like, 
to like if I ever bully somebody like don't do it because like they have a non-bully in place here like if you see somebody getting bullied like you should tell somebody were you involved in the choir musical of your acolyte at First Lutheran uh, what was it like well I was involved in acolyte and it was it was a good experience because you know you can do something during the church service, you have an opportunity to serve communion, take the offering, help out with baptisms. So it was a fun experience. Um, I've been reader of accolades. I was in the Christmas musical two years ago. Yep, I did all of them. When I was little, I did like the little kids choir and then when I was in middle school I was in the choir and musical and that was a lot of fun because I met a lot of new friends who were high schoolers and I thought that was so cool and then the last two years I did the musical with my dad which was pretty funny oh, yeah. and I met a lot of good people in there. We're beginning to see another generation coming up in our church and hopefully they will find the salvation that all the rest of us did and perhaps we will give them a heritage, something to go by something to live up to. Uh, God has been good to us and we will try to repay the Lord as best we can. It's been a pleasure being here and I hope that all continues to go well for our community and for our church.